This episode of the Cascadian Beer Podcast has been made possible by the BC Ale Trail. Arrive thirsty, leave inspired at bcaletrail.ca. You can learn from a book. You can learn through trial and error. But the best practice might actually be by passing down of knowledge through apprenticeship. Welcome to the Cascadian Beer Podcast. My name's Aaron, and I'm a Cascadian. I have a background in radio and television broadcasting. I'm a music producer and have a passion for beer. I don't consider myself an expert in beer by any means, but I do enjoy and respect the craft and the passion of these brewmasters. I want to learn from these pioneers and what sets them apart from the rest and why they choose to call Cascadia their home. Cascadia is a bioregion in the Pacific Northwest and the North American continent. It is made up of the U.S. states of Washington and Oregon, as well as the Canadian province of British Columbia. In this podcast series, I profile the unique breweries of Cascadia, a region that has a strong presence on the international beer scene. Victoria, British Columbia is a key center for craft beer in BC. Sean Hoyne started his career at the iconic Swans Pub when it opened in 1989. From there, he's been part of Victoria's craft beer scene ever since. And in recent years, he finally had the opportunity to open his own brewery. My name is Sean Hoyne. I am the owner and brewmaster at Hoyne Brewing Company in Victoria, BC. Right. And how long have you been open? The brewery has been open for just over six years now. How did beer find you? How did beer find me? Yeah. Uh, thirsty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in I, need of refreshment. In yeah. need of refreshment. Yeah. yeah. I uh, started home brewing when I was going to university in Montreal. Right. I was going to Concordia University and needed a supply of beer to get me through my studies, as do most students. Yeah. And uh, so I began home brewing back in the early 1980s. Do you remember your first brew? No, I don't. I remember uh, it was with two of my brothers and myself. Mm-hmm. And at when we first started, we were brewing using malt extract of mm-hmm. all things. Well, it, it's, it's a great place to start. It's where we started. Yeah, yeah. it's where you started. Uh, we very quickly moved on to uh, grinding our own grain and then getting a hold of some awesome hops and then, you know, pitching our own yeast in there and uh, fermenting. And uh, we were at that time bottling in stubby bottles, mm-hmm. the old Molson export stubbies. <laughs> mm-hmm. yep. uh, and uh, it didn't take long before we started moving into doing it in draft. And so that we uh, got rid of the bottles and uh, we continually sort of moved the craft forward, as it were. Right. And so what did you go to school to study? Well, I did a two-year science degree at uh, Vanier College in Montreal. And then when I started brewing, I was actually in a double major, creative writing and English literature, with the hopes of uh, perhaps one day becoming a teacher or a writer. And we continued brewing throughout that entire, well, I crammed a three-year degree into four years. And so uh, we needed a lot of beer to get through that. Well, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Just minor amounts of stress. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. So uh, then out of university, what, what did you do? Well, I actually moved out west to Victoria from Montreal because I had gotten accepted into the master's program at UVic in uh, literature. And while I was taking my uh, master's degree in English Lit, I uh, became aware that there was going to be a brand new brew pub opening up in Victoria. It was uh, due to uh, be called Swans. Mm-hmm. My wife, my she was my girlfriend at the time, but my wife now, she and I were walking past the front door of this building that was being renovated. And uh, she noticed on the door that this was going to be a brew pub. She uh, strongly implored me to put my resume in. Wow. <laughs> and so uh, I believed at the time that there would be no possible way I could ever get a job as a brewmaster. Well, how confident were you in your own beer at the time? Like, were you still brewing when you moved well, to Victoria? I was, and I was actually a full-fledged all-grain home brewer. And 
I think what got me the job was I showed up to the interview with Frank Appleton mm -hmm. uh, with a six pack of my homemade beer. And that's the best resume in the world. It, it was a, it was it was a good resume. Well, we yeah. uh, I I also brought with me the uh, recipes that I used in those different beers. And uh, just to prove you didn't scrub the label off. <laughs> <and then, laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and then uh, as soon as I walked through the door, Frank in his, uh, with his British accent asked me, so what have you got there? And, uh, I said, well, that's some of my homemade beer. And he said, well, there's no time like the present. Mm -hmm. And so we sat down and one by one, we worked our way through that six pack. Yep. Uh, we got to know each other. Uh, he was encouraged by my degree in sciences. Mm -hmm. He liked the fact that I, uh, was confident enough to bring my own homemade beer to an interview. And as an aside, we also shared a love of literature. Right. And so that sort of sealed the deal. Okay. And Frank gave me the opportunity to uh, learn under his tutelage. Right. So how long were you at Swans for then? I did my uh, brewing apprenticeship under Frank, and that took several months. During that time, what we did together was we uh, assembled the brewery. We designed a bunch of initial recipes. Which I've been there. It's the same brew house that it you is set a, up, right? It yeah. is exactly the same brew house. Yeah, yeah. it's an old uh, Ripley system, yeah. which uh, it's electric fired brew kettle, a great big mash ton, uh, a few fermenters. I think they've added a few fermenters since yeah. then. A yeah. bunch of conditioning tanks, uh, a cellar, which allowed us to pull up uh, some of the ales uh, using beer engines mm -hmm. right to the uh, taps. So we had these beer engines, beer pumps, hand pumps, where we could draw the beer from. And uh, so it was really, it, the whole thing was designed uh, to allow us to make predominantly British style ales. Mm -hmm. uh, I worked there for several years, uh, during which time I uh, sort of got better and better at my craft. Uh, I learned a lot from Frank, but then, you know, learning goes on as it does yeah. uh, when you're in a You just have to do it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then um, moving on from uh, Swans, what I did was uh, help to piece together the brewery at uh, the Canoe Brew Pub. And we opened that thing up in uh, May of 1998. I uh, was the uh, lone brewmaster there, and I operated that brewery for about 12 and a half years. Right. So it was really during that time that I honed my brewing skills. And it was an absolutely fantastic venue for doing just that. Uh, I could make any style of beer that I wanted to, but we uh, had to live within the limitations of a relatively small brewery. Yeah, how big was it? Well, we uh, the batch size was about 17 and a half hectoliters. So, but uh, the limitation was in the number of serving tanks. We only had five. Right. We had five fermenters and five serving tanks. Uh, they've since in increased that to seven. And so out of uh, those five, given that we had a pub and restaurant and patio with a capacity of well over 500 uh, patrons. In a tourist town, mind you. Even <laughs> right on the water. Yeah, right on the water. With yeah. perhaps the best patio in the city. Yeah. I had to design a bunch of beers that we were able to move substantial volumes of. And so the repertoire of beers uh, that I had there was geared largely towards very sessionable, palatable beers that people like to drink several of. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I covered the gamut with those five serving tanks, basically with a lager, a dark ale, a pale ale, an ESB, and then a seasonal. You know, we had something hoppy and we had something like a light lager and we had a dark ale and, you know, we covered the bases. And then I was able to play around with the seasonal and come out with all kinds of different uh, one-offs throughout the calendar. I'm in conversation with Sean Hoyne. We'll continue that in a moment. But first, I wanted to tell you about the BC Ale Trail, who made this episode possible. Victoria is quite the historic place in BC when it comes to craft beer, and there's lots to check out. And where do you begin? It can be a little bit daunting. Well, thankfully, the BC Ale Trail actually has an ale trail in Victoria for you. 
Uh, if you go to the website, bcaletrail.ca, you'll find recommended itineraries for each region of the province, not just Victoria, and a comprehensive list of every craft brewery in BC. There's also a calendar of beer events and a blog with lots of great stories. The regional ale trails include local breweries, pubs, and restaurants, along with other activities the area has to offer. So whether you're planning a weekend trip or being a tourist in your own backyard, let the BC Ale Trail guide you to your next beer adventure. Arrive thirsty, leave inspired at bcaletrail.ca. And thank you so much again, guys, for your support of this episode. All right, let's jump back into the conversation with Sean Hoyne of Hoyne Brewing. So you're at Canoe. Um, how does the idea of opening your own brewery come about then? Well, opening up my own brewery was a dream I had right from the very beginning of my professional career. Right. I uh, Wait, Was it a suggestion by your wife? <laughs> <laughs> no, actually. Oh, okay. No. Right. Uh, she, I think, in those years when our family was younger, mm-hmm. uh, was uh, thrilled that I had gainful employment. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, opening up a uh, business of your own can be, as I'm sure you know, a mm-hmm. risky endeavor. I've heard one or two stories <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> during this podcast, yes. Uh, but it was always a dream of mine uh, to own my own brewery. And I never let that dream go. I continued to be a brewmaster at uh, Canoe Brew Pub for all those years because A, I needed a paycheck and B, because I loved it. I loved the craft. I loved the business itself. And there was some sort of intensity too, because you didn't have that many conditioning tanks, you know, so you had to turn over quite a lot in the short season, right? So it was a very full on job. And I like that. I'm uh, Did it become like a seven day brew process in the summer? Yeah. Many weekends in the summer were spent uh, in the brewery and I, in the summertime designed a, a wheat beer Oh. A honey wheat beer that we just flew through. And mm-hmm. so that was my saving grace because I could uh, crank it out quickly. Yep. And you know, so it didn't take a long time to condition to make. It was served fresh and people loved it. And we went through volumes of it. And so that's that was sort of how we got through the huge increase in volume in the summertime. In the wintertime, I, I was allowed to... Uh, Take know, a vacation. Yeah. <laughs> Occasionally. <laughs> yes. Took a long weekend. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah, all throughout that entire time, it was uh, my dream to open up my own brewery. About two years prior to leaving Canoe, mm-hmm. I reopened a business plan that I had been uh, sort of chipping away at for many years. And I was talking about opening up my own brewery and my wife Uh, always uh, being uh, encouraging, asked me to either do it or don't talk about it anymore (laughs) because I've been dreaming about opening up my own brewery for such a long time. That's a very definitive line in the sand. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Uh, And then I went to the ownership at uh, Canoe and I let them know uh, that I was going to be opening up my own uh, brewery. They were very supportive. Uh, What I did at that point was I agreed to train a brewer. I agreed to leave all my recipes, of course. Mm -hmm. I agreed to act as a safety net for as long as was required. And I agreed to get them through the summer and leave on a time frame that worked for them. And so we left on really great terms. And I'm actually, I still love the place. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and I think that, you know, that speaks a little bit to the attitude that a lot of people have in the craft brewery community about uh, getting along with each other and supporting each other and genuinely being interested in the success of each other's business. Yeah, because I have a really hard time picturing another industry where it's just like, hey, I'm going to this other job. I'm going to do my own thing, but I'm going to help you out in the meantime and make sure that you're all taken care of before I get out of here. Like I, I really can't picture another industry where that's, that's so true. And I, and I think to be honest with you, I think that that came out of where the whole craft beer industry started in the very beginning. It was us against the big guys. Yeah. We were a handful of craft brewers who were standing up on our soapboxes saying, hey, check this out. This stuff is awesome. It's got flavor. It's got flavor <laughs> and color. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, and so we banded together. Mm-hmm. And, and each of us, you know, it was a small group at the time, and each of us believed in the merits of craft beer. And so we stuck together and we helped each other out. We helped each other with equipment issues. We helped each other with recipe formulation. We helped each other with quality control issues, with all kinds of things. And and that 
has continued to this day. The brewing community here in Victoria and over in Vancouver is absolutely amazing. Well, and even the smaller communities now, like on the island here, the small communities are getting amazing craft breweries as well in their tiny municipalities. And even like Northern BC too is getting some really nice breweries as well. Totally, so, totally. Yeah. I've got a friend up in Valemont who oh, yeah. opened up three ranges, mm-hmm. Michael Lewis. He's making a go of it in a tiny little town and he's putting out some good beers and yeah. he's having fun doing it. Yeah. And the community loves him for it. They're bringing employment to the area. Mm-hmm. Uh, the challenges that those guys have out in the the further reaches of the province are substantial. Yeah. You know, they've Logist- got- Just logistics of just getting supplies, oh, right? Oh, totally. Yeah. That's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But you know what? They believe in it yeah. and, and they're pioneers in their area, which is really cool. And and nothing to stop them from incorporating more local ingredients as well into their own totally. brews. So That's absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. All right. So here we go. Business plans open. Uh, how long did it take you from reopening that business plan to actually getting a building and then opening the door? Yeah. Well, um, the business plan had to be revised a couple of times. I went to a whole variety of lending institutions with the plan in hand. And even though at that time I had close to 20 years experience in the business. And what what year was this roughly? This was in about 2009. I was going around 2009, 2010. I was going around to a variety of banks uh, to try to get some support. I was shying away from investors and I kind of wanted to do this thing on my own. Mm -hmm. And the vast majority of the banks wanted nothing to do with it. And so... I began to, you know, gather credit cards, if you will, and I began to uh, build up lines a, of credit, line of credit, <laughs> lines yeah, of credit, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, one bank got behind me, and they helped me uh, with a very small sort of initial loan. I also started off by approaching Grant Olson from the Strathcona Pub here in town. He had a brewery that used to be called Hugo's Brewery. And it was a brew pub that sort of operated as a little bit of a nightclub. It was a really cool little place. But that thing uh, had to be dismantled because of some leasing arrangement. But anyway, he had this all this brewing equipment, very small brewing equipment. It was about an eight hectoliter system sitting in a warehouse. Right. And so I approached Grant with this idea of putting together a brewery. And I entered into an arrangement where I would lease that equipment from him. And that is what helped me get started. So that and a small loan from the bank and putting my house up uh, as collateral and taking out lines of credit. And uh, we, my wife and I uh, put our necks out on the line and we actually finally got it together. Right. So (laughs) here you go. You have an eight hex system, right? The doors are open. What was the response once the public came in? It was absolutely amazing. We were completely blown away. The uh, The response was unbelievable. And I think part of that was because so many of the people in Victoria that were lovers of craft beer mm-hmm. already knew me. Mm-hmm. They knew my reputation. They mm-hmm. knew... I mean, there's, there's a lot of craft breweries here, but it's a small scene. Like, it, it, but it's a small town in general, too. It like, really is. Yeah. And I there was, you know, a tremendous amount of goodwill out there in the marketplace mm-hmm. for Hoyne Brewery. Uh, as soon as we opened our doors, people flocked to us and we were selling all of our beer initially just out of growlers. And then uh, we added a bottling line and then we started to fill a few kegs and distribute our beer to some pubs and restaurants. And we've never looked back. It's it's grown considerably. We are six years in right now. We are up to about 35 employees starting out from one. Yeah. <laughs> We've grown to about 35. Which one, is, one in some uh, forceful volunteers of family members, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but um, uh, the business has grown tremendously and uh, we are nothing but extremely grateful and thankful for that. Uh, the community has really, really uh, supported us tremendously. And I think some of that, uh, a, a lot of it is probably due to that they really like the beer, yeah. but it's also... Uh, because we love the community that we live in. We support it. We Mm -hmm. give back to the community and we genuinely try to be as great an employer and company as we can. Uh, We treat people really well and we're proud of doing that. And so 
I think in a small community like Victoria, that goes a long way. Right. So here's an extreme challenge for you. In three words, what would you say defines a Hoyne beer? Three words, huh? Yeah, three words. Come on, you're a literary major. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I would say the first would be enjoyable. Mm -hmm. The second would be drinkable. And the third would be uh, traditional. Traditional. We tend to make beers that have... For the large, for a large part, we tend to make beers that have their roots in some sort of brewing tradition. Right. We love, I love the history of brewing. I'm a student of the history of brewing. I love the styles that are tried and true. Mm -hmm. You know, our Pilsner, for example, is uh, a Eastern European style Pilsner. And that's pretty textbook. It's pretty I, textbook. If I have to say, that's a pretty textbook Pilsner. Right. So, yeah. right. Yeah. And uh, a lot of the beers that we make have their roots in a long, rich, traditional history. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are also making a bunch of beers that are you know they're definitely more modern they're definitely more Experiment. experimental yeah. and we're we're getting some tremendous feedback but it's a balance between the two for example uh, next week we're coming out with a a new beer that we've not done before and it's going to be an irish stout well that's as traditional as it gets mm -hmm. i'm actually surprised you haven't done one before right. as 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 point <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah because because you would have done it at the other brew pubs that you were working at before right that's right we, yeah. i have now one of the uh one of the areas that I am really drawn towards, and I think is it's an area in the brewing world, especially the craft brewing, brewing world, that has been largely underrepresented, is uh, I love making lagers. Yeah. And uh, lagers for a long time were shunned by the craft beer world. Yes. Uh, I, I was actually saying this to some other brewers this week because um, we're, we're taping this during uh, Victoria Beer Week. And... I really do feel like this is the year of the lager. Like I really feel like it's going to come back because everybody came in with the hot bombs and then the juicy, you know, juicy IPAs, beers and yeah. the juicy IPAs. But now I think um, this is the year of really dialing in the lager, which everybody considered boring right. before. And it's right. like, well, no, you haven't had a good lager. Exactly. So, I agree yeah. so much with you. I, yeah. Right from uh, the very beginning of my brewing career, I made lagers a uh, centerpiece of my efforts yeah. at Swans in the very early mm. days, as soon as Frank went on to do other things, Frank Appleton, that is, I came out with a Bavarian lager. And in order to make that Bavarian lager, I got yeast right from a brewery in Munich. I uh, brought in malts from that area, brought in hops from the Czech Republic. And uh, I've been making lagers ever since. And the, you know, the entire craft beer industry kind of got started as a revolt against what the big breweries were doing. They were revolting against these bland, tasteless lagers mm -hmm. that the big breweries had the mass public uh, believing was all there was to beer. And so there was the consumer advocacy group, Campaign for Real Ale, that mm -hmm. originated out of Great Britain. And it was the Campaign for Real Ale, not the Campaign for Lager. It was Campaign for Real Ale. And these guys wanted to bring back the awesome ales that they had had in the old country growing up. Porters and stouts and pale ales and IPAs and mm -hmm. really amazing Ales with brown ales, with color and flavor, as you say. Yeah. Well, the craft beer industry adopted that mantra and made almost exclusively ales yeah. for the longest time. We've gotten pretty ridiculous with some of the hops uh, <laughs> <laughs> in some of these IPAs in terms of pounds per, per liter. Right. And, yeah, yeah. People are certainly pushing the envelope, but yeah. I have uh, honestly been trying to bring back the good name that loggers have mm -hmm. had for a long time. Mm -hmm. And in an effort to do so, I not only come out with Pilsner, but we've got another style of beer that is has largely been forgotten, mm -hmm. a Dortmunder. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, a Dortmunder, Dortmunders uh, at one point in time were the most popular style of beer in continental Europe. Dortmunders were beautiful golden lager. They originated in Dortmund. They were originally brewed to quench the thirst of these hardworking coal miners. Mm -hmm. The coal miners would emerge from the mines at the end of the day with their faces black with coal dust, and they would be looking for a nice 
uh, thirst quenching beer in their local uh, drinking hole. And the local brewery would made this beautiful golden lager. And it became so popular that uh, they wanted to export it out of Dortmund. And that's what re was referred to as a Dortmunder export. Mm -hmm. And so in order to export it, they made it a bit stronger in alcohol. They turned it up a notch to uh, 6%. And they uh, it, it just uh, you know took Europe by storm. Uh, Dortmunders have largely disappeared off the radar. Uh, Pilsners have certainly eclipsed them. But the uh, that style, I believe, is an amazing style of beer. It's a you know slightly stronger golden lager. Yeah, and so it's super refreshing. It's still using all those noble hops from the Hallertau region of Germany. Mm -hmm. um, I use malted barley's from Germany from a company called Best Malts in mm -hmm. Germany to brew the beer and uh, a, a, an amazing lager yeast strain. And so that's one of the lagers that I'm right behind. And uh, Vienna lager is another. Yeah. And, and so I've long uh, been making lagers uh, central to what I do. And even though it is, you know, for lack of a better word, a simple beer, it is very technical and difficult to make, right? It is. And uh, the complexity of a well-made lager uh, is, well, if you, if you get it wrong, those errors that are made are accentuated by the subtleties of the beer. They stand out. With an ale, typically, especially a highly hopped ale, you can mask those imperfections. And then with your juicy beers, too, you can cover that up in the whirlpool by adding the hops later, right? Absolutely, so, yeah. absolutely, or in dry hopping. Yeah. And, uh, but that's not to say anything uh, negative about ales. I, we love ales, too. Mm -hmm. They all have their place. Which you have an amazing dark ale that you make for wintertime right. for your dark matter. Yeah. Dark matter, exactly, yeah. We're actually finding that we sell almost as much of dark matter in the summer as we do the winter. Wow. Which is, it's an amazing thing. <laughs> right. Uh, but you know what? I have long believed that uh, the Irish, this is something the Irish have been well aware of for a long time, centuries. People love dark beer. Yeah, but I mean, the Irish, they're under clouds 365 days a year. <laughs> you know, we have this nice microclimate here in Victoria. It's, you know, it's a little different, right? That is so, so true. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I used to make a dark beer at uh, Canoe Brew Pub, and I would... Uh, I was continuously amazed by how much of it we went through all year round. People love dark beer. And uh, the big breweries for a long time tried to tell us that we didn't, which uh, in my mind is nonsense. And turns out that people do love dark beer. Right. And so, yeah, dark matter is just, uh, it has taken off. Yeah. Yeah. So where do you go from here? I mean, are there any expansion plans in the work or are you very comfortable with the size you're at now? Well, there's a couple things going on right now. One is um, because I was fortunate enough to have, you know, received my apprenticeship mm -hmm. under a guy like Frank Appleton, mm -hmm. who he was the guy that started the entire craft beer industry in British Columbia. Because I was fortunate enough to learn under Frank Appleton, I've long been of the belief that uh, the passing on of knowledge in the brewing industry is so important and it's so valuable. And so what I uh, have done in uh, at Hoyne Brewery is about a year and a half ago, I went to my uh, small team of brewers, you know, guys who have been with me for four or five years at the time and have learned the craft under me and have fallen in love with the craft of brewing. I went to those guys and I said, you guys are awesome at making beer. And I think it's time that you uh, designed your own recipes. And so uh, I've given, I, I gave them the freedom to come up with a series of beers. We're calling it the, uh, either the apprenticeship series or the young lions series. Mm. And I basically allowed them to design their own recipe, right. use any ingredients that they wanted to use, mm -hmm. come up with uh, the style of beer they want to make, come up with the idea for the label on the bottle, completely design a beer right from scratch. Wow. And uh, so the first beer that they came out with, because I gave them such freedom, the first beer was called Carte Blanche. <laughs> right. And uh, coincidentally, or not, 
it was a uh, Belgian white IPA. Mm -hmm. So uh, the name sort of fit the style. Mm -hmm. And the second one uh, was called Terra Firma and uh, it's a Saison. And uh, so they're, uh, they're working hard on the third uh, in that series. So that's one of the areas that we're moving into. Just nice one-offs. and Doing some really cool yeah. one-offs. We also, um, as of two days ago, we have acquired a, uh, another warehouse. All right. And Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, the warehouse will be used to condition and package our beer. We're going to move a bunch of conditioning tanks over into that uh, warehouse. It's going to allow, allow us to, especially with the loggers, which require a long time mm -hmm. to condition, mm -hmm. we're gonna, it's going to allow us to give the beer that much more time in the conditioning tanks. And then uh, we're going to package the beer into 12-ounce uh, bottles. Up until now, we've been only in the 22 ounces, the yep. uh, 650 mil bottles. We're going to get into 12 ounces, and then perhaps at some point in the near future, uh, we'll get into cans. Uh, so that's really going to round out our offerings, if you will, mm -hmm. and the formats that we're in. And so that's sort of where we're going to see the next couple of years take us. Right. Well, if you have a new warehouse, are you going to have like a barrel aging program or anything like that? That or? is definitely been talked about. Okay. I would love to do a barrel uh, program as with uh, almost anything that we do. I want to go at it in a really, you know, with a thorough understanding of it. And so I want to study it mm -hmm. and I don't want to do it haphazardly. No, no, no. I don't want to just launch in, I don't want to just put a bunch of beer into barrels and see what happens. Yeah, yeah. What I want to do is uh, go to some of the people who are doing it right now, especially down in the States and all over the place, people are doing barrel programs mm -hmm. and learn from them. Yeah. And then once we're ready to embark upon a barrel program, I want to make sure that the stuff that we do is at least as great as the other offerings that are available. Mm -hmm. And by doing so, we're adding to the landscape rather than just crowding it. And that's that'll be my approach. Right. Yeah. So if anybody was want to go down the path themselves of opening up their own brewery, what would be some advice that you could give them? Uh, the biggest piece of advice that I would give them is to have a love of the craft to begin with yeah. uh, and get some expertise behind you. The uh, brewing, the craft beer landscape right now has a lot of players and the bar has been raised as you, uh, you know, if you will, the, uh, the level of quality of beer, I believe is uh, getting better and better and better all the time. Mm -hmm. And so if, you know, it used to be that you could just kind of open your doors and wing it mm -hmm. and hope for the best. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, I've and, seen a few. Yeah. Right. And, and then, <laughs> yeah. you know, and we've also seen breweries with some fluctuating results mm -hmm. uh, where there's some dramatic inconsistencies uh, from batch to batch and perhaps some microbiological issues that they may have. Mm -hmm. My advice would be to spend the time to do it right. Yeah. You know, this is an industry that's been around for a long, long time, and we want to honor it with quality. Mm -hmm. Our customers expect that and they deserve that. Yeah. And so anything that anybody comes out with, in my opinion, ought to add to the landscape rather than just overcrowd the landscape. So if you're coming out with a beer, be proud of it. Mm -hmm. Make sure that it's made with impeccable quality. Yeah. And uh, you go into it understanding that your customer, the people who are drinking this beer, are pretty educated. They're yeah. pretty good at tasting beer. Well, I mean, you've been talking about like some some ancient beers that you're wanting to do, like that have kind of fallen out of fashion. It's like, don't forget, don't forget the roots of the industry, right? Like don't just open to make modern beers. You need to understand the past of where the future is going with it, right? I agree completely. Yeah. Beers are have been around for a long time. A really nice thing though, is that in today's current climate, the um, number of satellite industries that have emerged around the craft breweries, it's amazing. The the people mm -hmm. who are building equipment, for example, like mm -hmm. we, we have specific mechanical right here on the island yeah. who are making you know, completely state-of-the-art, fully automated, awesome equipment. These industries have emerged around us, which allow us as brewers to 
have enormous control over our quality assurance and our quality control. And then there's the malting uh, facilities as well that are popping up. Absolutely. And, and, the, and the hop farms that are coming back to BC as well. So, yeah. You're, you, you've yeah. nailed it. Exactly. Yeah. You have... You know, you have pioneers in the industry like uh, Phillips Brewing Company, mm-hmm. and they're out there malting their own barley, yeah. which is, is ama- it's an amazing thing. Yeah. And you have, uh, you know, other people in the industry who are really trying to solidify that supply chain of raw materials. Mm-hmm. I've got a, a farmer over on Pender Island who he's converting his entire acreage to growing hops. And it's not because there's a ton of money in it. It's because he loves beer Mm -hmm. and he wants to see the craft beer industry succeed. And then like due east from here over in the States um, in Skagit County, um, Skagit Valley malting, how they're like organizing with the farmers to have the cover crops be different strains of malt. You know, for, exactly. for all the, and so it's yep. not, it's not just BC. It's just everybody here in the Pacific Northwest is like really tying into what they're doing. So. Well, that's totally true. And then even downstream with all of, you know, these breweries are support, like with their spent grain, mm-hmm. they're sending them out to local farms and those local farms are using the spent grain mm-hmm. to uh, feed their animals yeah. and fertilize their fields. Exactly. And yeah. uh, so it really, well, what else are you going to do with that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's right. You got to get yeah. rid of it somehow. Yeah. yeah. But it, so it really, works on that level. And I will say that the other really cool thing that I I guess I didn't fully anticipate when I was getting into this business was the deep connection that you would have to community. Mm -hmm. We support, and not just us, I'm I'm talking collectively, the craft brewing community collectively Mm -hmm. supports a countless number of causes Mm -hmm. and of efforts to raise money for various things. They, we support various groups. We support sports teams and various, all kinds of different things where the community looks to us as being a very integral part of helping each other out. Yeah. And I find that to be really cool. The ability for us to give back, you know, some people might look at that and think that, well, that's just a marketing thing, mm-hmm. but it really isn't. Most of the efforts that we undertake and most of the support goes completely unnoticed, yeah. except for by the people who we're supporting. Yeah. And so we don't do it for the publicity. We do it because it's the right thing to do. And and I think that a lot of us craft breweries are uh, approached on a regular basis by community organizations who are you know usually volunteers mm-hmm. trying to help somebody else out. Yeah. And, and even to the greater extent for the benefit of the city as well, we were talking about tourism earlier, like you're kind of a reason to be a reason to go visit Victoria as well for you and the other breweries around in the area. It's right? totally so, true. We yeah. get countless number of tourists walk into our uh, growler station yeah. every week. It's amazing. I don't know how they find us, yeah. <laughs> but they do. Yeah. I guess uh, Google Maps is a thing, right? Well, and the, the BC Ale Trail as well, which is a great initiative to bring you in and totally, yeah, and just yeah. be be a guide to this great community. That's that. This is my first time here at Hoyn, and I almost walked past it because there's no fanfare out the front, right? So right. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, just yeah. like there's beer in here. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fresh beer here. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. All right. So if somebody was wanting to uh, start home brewing for the first time, what would be some good practical tips that you can give the home brewer? Really good practical tips. There There is so much information available online right now. Mm -hmm. That said, don't do it by yourself. No. Join up with some buddies, some friends who are interested in beer. It's always great to have a second pair of eyes. It (laughs) totally is. And somebody else to share a pint with. Oh, yeah. And uh, uh, what I would recommend is go into it uh, with the aim of making quality beer. Yeah. So it's going to initially take a little bit of an investment. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to buy some stuff and time and a bit of time, but the time spent brewing beer is fun. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've home brewed for years and you're always having a good time doing it. Yeah. And, uh, so, Uh, I would say uh, enjoy it as a hobby. I would say uh, pursue it as a science. There's so much literature out there that you can read and study up on. Mm -hmm. Uh, The further your understanding of the craft, the better your beer is going to be. And get out there and talk to your local breweries because I've got a great number of home brewers that come by our brewery all the time and I'll give them yeast or I'll give them some hops or tell them about a certain type of malt that we're using. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the sharing of knowledge and uh, we support home brewers because they love the craft. 
they're into it because they just love beer. They're who we speak to. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. All right. Well, thank you. This has been fun. Huge thank you to Sean. It was so nice in Victoria that day that we sat outside. So, you know, apologies for the seagulls, but uh, yeah, we sat out in the loading dock in the sunshine and drank a beer and had a great chat. And thank you so much, Sean. Had a really great time uh, at the brewery. And if you want to go check them out, uh, highly recommend it. Um, you know, it, 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 you do need to watch out. Like I said, I walked right past it the first time uh, I was there. So, uh, yeah, just look for the sign. Thank you so much again to the BC Ale Trail for making this episode possible. You can check them out and other things that you can do in Victoria by going to bcaletrail.ca. If you like this podcast episode or like the series in general, please leave us a review wherever you listen to this podcast because it really helps us get this into as many ears as possible. If you want to follow us on social media, you can by going to facebook.com forward slash Cascadian Beer. I'm on Twitter at Cascadian Beer and on Instagram at Cascadian Beer Podcast. You can also check out more episodes by going to cascadian.beer. My name's Aaron. Thank you so much again for your time. Really appreciate it. And I hope you enjoyed this episode. And until next time, remember, support your local.